Well, it is our tremendous pleasure to have uh, Fernando telling us about numerical techniques and graphics scattering all of this. Thanks. Um, let me start by thanking the Institute and <clears throat> all of you for coming here. I think it has been a uh, pleasure to have this uh, program. And so I figured that somehow we heard from Manny on Monday about some calculations that we recently did about the uh, calculation of cosmic confiscation corrections to uh, conservative uh, potential for uh, black holes with spin. And underneath it is a, is a series of techniques that we have been developing over the last uh, six, seven years uh, in which we compute uh, a scattering amplitude purely numerical. Um, and so I, uh, as, as perhaps, uh, this is uh, uh, new. I, I decided to give a little bit of an uh, overview of what we actually do. So in this little uh, picture, uh, this perhaps doesn't fit so well here in the uh, in the theme of this uh, program, but uh, we see some sort of gluonic amplitudes, and I have a observable, very interesting data from this year at Atlas. So, but yes, I can actually say that we also have made connection with something related to the gravitational wave. But in a sense, uh, all of the theme of the of the presentation today is about the numerical instability methods and the fact that this technology that I'm going to talk about is rather generic, and we can actually do calculations in very um, general effective theories. Um, okay, so so the the structure of the talk is uh, rather simple. I have a very quick the intro, then I spend some time describing what the numerical unitary meters is, and end up with uh, with what is actually rather peculiar that even though these are calculations that are purely numerical, um, we can actually extract analytics out of them. So, in the context of collider phenomenology, uh, uh, particularly for hadron colliders, we are always thinking of an expansion um, of observables in terms of the strong coupling. It doesn't need to be the strong coupling, it can be any other coupling, but, but let's say for simplicity, uh, we organize our perturbative expansion in this shape um, where we have a leading piece. Uh, if this is a cross section, we have a leading piece next to the leading order, next to the next to the leading order, etc. And the, and the structure of, the, um, of this perturbative expansion is such that at leading order, we have typically, it depends specifically on the, on the type of observable. But a fixed order, a, a leading order, uh, in a fixed order regulation, typically we have a three level amplitude um, with a, the bar here, meaning like you have an interference to compute the, the cross section, um, three level amplitude interfere with itself. And as long as uh, 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 while you go down uh, or, or higher in, in precision, let's say, you need more and more combinations. And this is kind of sort of a schematic, uh, there are certain things that are, might be missing there, but. But uh, you can see that um, uh, we need more and more uh, type of, of scattering amplitude. So for example, at MLO, we have the one loop amplitudes signified here with like, this little uh, green line, and we have real uh, contribution. At MLO, we have more and more, but then the thing that I want to highlight here is that in the end, for actually making precise predictions, you normally need, in the context of a, a um, uh, for phenomenology, a, mar a marriage of uh, amplitudes. Um, I go from three level with many external legs to, to higher loop. And, um, and given that, for example, uh, uh, studies at LHC are expected to, to reach uncertainties of the order of few percent, it means that these are these are really real kind of things that we are confronted as a theories in order to make the most out of the machines that we have at the day. Um, and um, you see, actually, in action, it shows that uh, this sort of expansion is, is rather good. Um, I just very quickly show one of the uh, perhaps most important sort of uh, observables, uh, which is Higgs production at the LHC. Um, on the right hand side, you have a distribution for this uh, production of this type of particle uh, uh, as a function of uh, rapidity. Um, um, and you see uh, the same type of uh, uh, perturbative expansion, but computed here at leading order and along the way to N3 along. And perhaps the thing to highlight is that when you reach fourth order calculation, which is this little band that is reddish here on top of the hash one, 
you finally see some convergence and, and the, the, the uncertainties uh, of those calculations are highly, um, let's say, highlighted by the width of those, of those uh, distributions there, which really get to the point that are down to uh, the percent. Um, so typically speaking, yes, we, are, we we need to get at least to to this sort of uh, uh, fair order uh, perturbative expansion, uh, third term in the perturbative expansion um, for a variety of multi-particle, multi jet processes. And this really stresses our computation capabilities. So that's sort of the, the idea why um, we started to, to think about a, a procedure to actually make calculation of, uh, of multiple types of, uh, of uh, scattering amplitudes, including um, higher loop corrections. And that's where, where this story starts, very different, very disconnected, but in the context of uh, uh, polarity phenomenology, but in the uh, framework of the quantum field theory. Right? That's what we are going to let us connect with gravity a bit later. Okay, so a common approach uh, to compute multi-loop uh, scattering amplitudes uh, might look like this. Uh, there, is, there, is no, there is no standard. Uh, the, the people do things differently, but let's say, uh, normally you might think, okay, I have an observable. I sort of think of all of the Feynman diagrams that I need that up to a certain given order. I go through a series of process, procedures like tensor reduction, I, integration by part identities to reduce into a set of master integrals. And once I have my, my uh, let's say the, the integral which, which I started expressing depths only of these master integrals, I might want to actually solve for them, for example, with differential equation, but there are many, many other techniques that you can use, direct integration, um, uh, study of the special functions that you need to expand these, these uh, final integrals, numerical computation like set, sector of competition, the composition. Tropical Monte Carlo, or oh, whatever. Oh, there are so many ways of doing this. Uh, but now, uh, let's say this, this sort of general procedure um, works and is expected to uh, to be helpful in some sense, uh, up to perhaps certain order in the particular expansion. But for sure, it it is well known and understood that it uh, generates large large intermediate expressions. Um, some of the steps might actually be technically complicated. And, uh, and in a sense, the techniques that are based on the so-called generalized unitarity comes to a rescue. And in particular, when we have numerical, uh, the numerical version of it is actually um, helps a lot because in a sense, you perform the, the reduction of your, of your integral and the evaluation of the amplitude itself simultaneously. And you have a purely numerical uh, calculations, which immediately sort of hides, not completely, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but uh, hides some of the complications of uh, large integrated expressions. So, so then, yes, uh, so then we, we actually look into this, this sort of alternative. Uh, in, in generalized unitarity, you normally start uh, your calculation by thinking uh, of an answer for your amplitude. So in here, I'm not representing a generic multi-loop amplitude, uh, which gets decomposed into a series of a set of functions, special functions that we call the master integrals, um, which are written um, uh, which, uh, with some coefficients uh, that bring you back to, to the amplitude. There is a little bit of notation there. Uh, this gamma I use as, 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 a, as a symbol for a given propagator structure in your amplitude. And within a given propagator structure, you have a series of uh, of functions that are that live and live on that um, uh, on support of, of those propagator structures. Um, the, the set of master integrals is process independent. Let's say that if you are at an even order, at an even level, uh, the, the master integrals uh, only depend on the kinematics uh, of, the, of the process that you're analyzing and, uh, and the size of, of that cell is finite. And this is known um, uh, by work uh, by Smirnov and all these factors. Um, so for the numerical um, version of the uh, unitarity approach, we actually move forward and even write down an answer not only for the amplitude, but for the full integral of the amplitude. So, so this is the same amplitude, but now I sort of remove uh, the integral symbol a bit. 
and then I, I write down an answer um, that has coefficients, but notice that the, the number of terms, of course, in the answer uh, uh, changes, right? Um, so, so and, and, and I have to introduce a series of, of functions that basically parameterize every possible integral that, that I can write in, in the type of theories that, are, um, that I'm actually analyzing. So there is a lot of uh, discussion and what that I, I'm going to comment about it, that uh, of what type of functions you can choose to actually express uh, your integrand uh, in a way that is uh, beneficial for the type of problem that you are looking at. Uh, so for example, yes, I, I put some names here, tensor basis, master circuit basis, cathode plane tensor. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, those terms uh, next. Um, Okay, uh, so to do that, let me for a second um, think of, of one of these diagrams. You can think of a, like a one loop triangle or a couple of box or a Mercedes ventricle box diagram. Um, uh, I, I am one way uh, to actually write uh, down these, uh, uh, these parametrizations is, is, is by, by the uh, means of parameterizing the loop moment itself. Um, so, so there is an adaptive type of parametrization in which we write down the loop momentum in terms of some variables are intimately associated to the propagators themselves. But I mean, oh, if you want uh, some, bar, some, some momenta that live in the scattering plane um, of a given uh, branch of loop momentum, there is a, a subindex L here that is kind of telling you that if you have three loop, you, you will have three of these objects uh, um, hanging around the diagram that we are analyzing. Um, then there is an extra dimensional piece. So this is like a scattering plane a space that I'm covering here. And then there is the extra dimensional working dimensional regularization. It's an extra dimensional piece. And there are two leftover things that are, um, um, that we highlight a, a, a kind of importantly. Uh, one is the pieces that pa parameterize the rest of the scattering plane of your process that is not attached to the Puebla loop momentum. And uh, this gives rise to, to some sort of variable that we call the irreducible scalar products, which basically are sort of uh, dot products of loop momenta that cannot be written in terms of, of propagators. And then one piece that I call the common transfers, uh, which is that when you look at your full um, diagram that you're analyzing, how many four dimensional pieces uh, leave uh, perpendicular to the scattering planes, and we call these the common transfers. Um, variable. So, so this is just a, a, a parametrization of the loop momentum. And so it's actually relatively helpful because it turns out that uh, the, the whole three parameters that you have in your, your loop momentum are only associated uh, to these two subspaces. And then uh, what we call as a tensor basis parametrization is basically a construction of all possible monomials that you have on the variables, these alphas are kind of the variables that let you uh, cover all of the loop momentum parametrization um, um, that, that lie in those two spaces. Um, so this is actually a rather simple uh, parametrization of your integrand. So, so remember, I'm trying to, to build functions that, that parameterize my integrand. So it's actually a very simple parametrization that easily tells you information about, for example, the dimension of the space uh, that covers uh, generic in integrants in, in field theories, which have some, of course, you always have some sort of given power counting in the theory. So if you are in QCD, you have renormalized sort of power counting. If you are working in theories like um, like gravity, you, you have to put away about that. Now, a more interesting uh, parametrization is actually given by these same monomials, uh, but just written in terms of the ISPs. And then uh, you basically uh, uh, get rid of all of the monomials that, that you have in the common transfer space by building some sort of um, functions that simply drop out after integration. And there is a very natural connection to one loop studies that happens um, uh, uh, by, by the so-called OPP um, uh, method in, in one loop regulations. Uh, which makes that this sort of a scattering plane terms of basis is just a very natural extension of, of what we know at one loop. Um, now, of course, it turns out that out of um, after after you do that, uh, that there is always uh, some leftover reducible monomials, 
which you can only actually find through, so for example, IPP reduction, this sort of systematic reduction of tensor integers um, that you have. Uh, but it turns out that the amount of them is rather small. So, so even if we are talking about, like, for example, a, an integral that is associated to a gravity scattering amplitude, the amount of integrals, integrals that, that are left to final IPP reduction in this kind of procedure is rather small. You're called Mauricio Abebo? Uh, yes, but I will tell you a bit more about what is available. What is available. Sorry, the, the sums are all dependent. Um, uh, the first one, the four sums. Yes. You have no formal. Uh, there is no overlap. We actually split uh, like 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 the four dimensional pieces into the yeah. covering plane, um, the, uh, either in the first piece or in the second, then the transfer and then the d dimension. So, so there is no overlap. Okay. Yeah. Just to show it. And then perhaps um, a powerful idea that came by Haralita in 2015 is that. You can even, in the case of those leftover uh, uh, monomials that are there that, that you would like to do your IPP reduction, you can actually build functions, functions like integral functions, that either give you a master integral of our very, very first uh, answer that we know that they have to exist, or that they actually just drop out. And we call this a surface term. Um, so, so, so in a sense, Let's let's say that um, that that you have uh, an integral that you have done an IPP reduction. This sort of a statement is rather natural. You just basically build out of your IPP relations functions that naturally integrate to zero, and we call those uh, surface terms. Um, uh, very good. But um, this is very powerful. We have uh, made use of it, and I will tell you a little bit more how we actually. Uh, go in that direction. So, so to build up this master surface decompositions, uh, so we start, of course, by looking at the typical uh, sort of uh, relation, uh, which is that uh, for, for building IPP uh, identities, uh, which is that uh, the sort of uh, total derivative of, of function in dimensional regularization that are identical to zero. Uh, so basically, this is the start of, of uh, something like a Laporte program for uh, in the final reduction of, uh, of uh, generic integrals. Um, but uh, in work by David and collaborators, and uh, later also Schallinger also, um, there was a, 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 a realization that the one problem that you have with IPP relations is that uh, this, when, when this derivative hit the, the, the functions row, which are like the inverse propagators, uh, so you end up mapping um, relations between um, uh, integrals that have different uh, powers of propagators. And, 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 and a very good idea for several reasons is to actually try to keep uh, those propagator structure the same across the relations that you're finding. And so in order to actually uh, find these sort, of, these sort of identities, you put a constraint of, on the type of vectors that lie in the uh, inner brackets here in this relation. And uh, the relation that basically tells you that those those things that double propagator, let's say if you if you hit the derivative of one of the propagator, will end up being dropped by by the identity that you are imposing. And this is the so called unitarity compatible at integers by part relations. Um so, so okay, so then in principle, you could in principle try to uh, write an answer for, for UJ nu, um uh, expanded in the term of external momenta, loop momenta. And, um, and so the, the, the implicit polynomial equation that is given by this relation, um, and, and if you are able to do that, which is not an easy problem, um, uh, you can actually use those same vectors to build a full set of surface terms, the ones that I was mentioned before. And uh, uh, to the point, you can even do this test numerically that you are filling the, 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 the function space, the point that anything that is left, any holes that are left in the dimension of the uh, function space uh, are the so-called master integrals that will give you, will be associated to the master integrals. Now, uh, how how do you do that? Let me just just drop uh, some simple example here with a, with a one loop uh, integral. Suppose that you have this triangle integral where all of the lines, all of the black lines are massless. You have a massive uh, line here, so this is what is called as the one mass uh, massless triangle. 
Um, so we have these uh, inverse propagators. Uh, in principle, you, uh, as I was saying, you can parameterize the, the this uh, integration by uh, this uh, IBB generating vector that for you like that UV. Uh, in terms of the momenta in your problem and the, the sort of conditions to keep the propagator structure the same just look like this. Uh, it basically, the derivative of the propagator will give you just functions of the uh, uh, polynomial function as the propagator. And then you basically have to find um, um, solutions to this type of polynomial equations. I, I write there uh, a generic solution for this one case. And then what happened, we can actually read off the, the, the vector in such way that when we plug it in, into our IBP, the, the object that we end up just looks like, like this, right? So we have a triangle uh, integral and a series of, of, um, of, um, uh, of terms in our integral, that some of which contain the, the propagator and, and a scalar bar. So basically the scalar, what, what we're finding here is that in this case, this, mass, this one mass triangle uh, can be replaced by a surface term. Although I have to say that uh, normally in, in, in one loop uh, programs, this is kept as a master integral. Um, and that's actually beneficial for several reasons like numerical stability and the source. But, but in principle, yes, the, that integral is reducible. And here what you have is one function that shows this type of surface terms that I was alluding to. Um, notice that uh, this relation is just basically an IBP relation that we can write it in terms of actual integrals. Here there is like three terms. One drops out because one is a, um, a scaleless integral that we mentioned in the regularization that drops out. Now similar SIP manipulation can be carried out at higher loops, um, but of course these sort of polynomial equations um, are more complicated and uh, you might actually um, and it needs to use some uh, advanced uh, techniques, uh, for example, from algebra and geometry to, to, to find all, pot all potential vectors um, um, in a way that, um, that you can use for constructing these facilitators. Uh, and my surface uh, integrals. Um, now, <laughs> one thing that I I will mention is that if you look at this story in the one case, it seems like we managed to construct one uh, uh, one function that gives us um, a surface term. But the point is that once you have these solutions, once you have these IBP generating vectors, we can actually parameterize any numerator for any given propagator structure no matter what the power counting of your theory is. So, so let me say this, if you have a QCD calculation or if you have a gravity calculation, in principle, you can just sort of build a, a factory of surface terms uh, and produce this surface term industrially, basically because any product of a polynomial function in your, in, in your momentum with, with the, these vectors will actually give you a relation um, and, and you just need to make sure that the function that, that you plug in in your integral parameterization are um, linearly independent. And this is something that you can efficiently check, for example, also in the variable. So, so then the comment that is down here, a four graviton amplitude calculation in einstein Hilbert gravity is basically structurally the same as a four room amplitude computing through, through this purely numerical problem. Okay, um, so for that integral uh, um, parameterization, you might ask, okay, what is the way we actually solve for the for these amplitudes? Um, well, um, yes, that, that's the base of, of the unitarity method. Um, also, David, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, persons that introduced this concept of late in early in the nineties. Um, so if you actually uh, sample your integrals in um, in on shell configuration, those are loop momentum configurations in which the different propagators actually go on shell, they, they, they take their mass shell. Um, the integral itself actually factorizes as, as a product of trees. So, so the different orders in these type of diagrams. And of course, the, the integral parameterization that we just built is very easy to, to see what is the leading pole. You, you go to, you do some sort of partial fractioning in these variables that are the inverse propagator, and then you can actually easily map the left-hand side and the right-hand side. 
Um, and, and if the things that I don't know are, are the coefficients that are here that are process dependent, that are theory dependent, uh, well, if I have the possibility of computing three level amplitudes, I can extract them all just by numerical means. So, in a sense, I just end up with something that needs an efficient computation of product of three level amplitudes, the left hand side. And we can do this through many means. Uh, one, one of them, for example, is by using off shell recursions. Um, but you can use any any technology um, uh, that you have available for that. Um, one thing that is important is that the uh, uh, as you see here, there is a sum over the internal states uh, of the lines that, that you cut there, and um, and something what was first observed by Gilles Bruns and Melnikov is that um, if you perform this stain sum in several different dimensions where you have finite representation for the particles that travel in your diagram. Uh, you can actually reconstruct the full DS dependence of, of your amplitudes and basically uh, get the full loop amplitudes out of products of two. Uh, and perhaps the, the message to highlight after this discussion is that, in a sense, we never construct that analytic integral. We that's that's why we bypass, for example, the need of building a, a, a Feynman diagram representation for the amplitudes that we have at hand. And we just can use purely the numeric evaluation in kinematic configuration to extract the actual coefficients that in the end give, give us the, the amplitude. Um, just very briefly, um, so for computing the, the products of trees in generalized unitarity, if you are in a, in a context that you are doing an analytic continuation, you benefit dearly from compact representation of these three level amplitudes. So there was a question that we, so I think, for example, about double copies, and then it, it, it was completely married with the technology uh, that we have for uh, amplitude tabulation. Well, it, not necessarily. I mean, you have many ways of computing this problem of three. If you are in an analytic uh, calculation, so yes, you do benefit from double copy or color kinematics, uh, duality, or group of three, etc. But for example, if we have, a, yes. Like, uh, I would say it's impossible to the IS one. Uh, so, if you want something like uh, with a um, causality properties, like you do something similar. Oh, I have seen only the integral operators. Um, uh, the, yeah, it, it works in a sense perfectly because what, what I really targeting with the procedure that I described are the coefficients which are rational functions. So there is no I epsilon, and so so as long as you as you uh, uh, compute your master integrals with the corresponding prescription that you have, so so you can actually map it in, in, in the prescription. Okay, but you yes. Okay. Um, so you will just so it's not that you the problem with the master integrals. Correct. Yeah, and then you have okay. to compute that. I mean, the, the generalized imperative that's effectively or doing matching that others to the mentality complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was talking about before this in class, but yeah, but not before this. Uh, but anyway, no, but these generalized class are the complex values of the mental. Sure, so it's very far away from the bias. Okay, so now on the side of a, of a thought that is built up on the idea of numerics, uh, having a recursive approach, like for example, through shared recursions. Is actually beneficial in the sense that it makes the, the tool itself more flexible. And that's one of the things that, for example, in the build up of the, of the tools that I'm going to comment on later, uh, we have preferred uh, to use some of these uh, Berenski uh, Schunger Dyson relations. Um, but, uh, but we have built it in such a way that it's actually rather modular and we can use any of them. So, uh, so for those of you that haven't seen it, so so this sort of very similar relations is the fact that whenever you have a current, let's say, built up of a series of particles, this could be like purely gluonic uh, theory, which means, um, so in QCD, you only have three and four, uh, four point vertices, you can actually recursively build uh, these sort of currents for subcurrents. Um, and the, there is a natural caching mechanism that is occurred through, through this uh, recursion that is very beneficial numerically. And I'm going to show you um, what this means uh, in, in a bit. Um, so we have been extended these sort of relations to generic current types. It doesn't need to be clones. Um, it can be fermions, it can be um, 
uh, rabbit nose, etc. Um, uh, for computing uh, not only uh, currents for trees, but also for products of trees, meaning that we, we have in the recursion the, capaci uh, the capacity to drop uh, propagators and just keep uh, some sort uh, of overstates. Um, uh, in it, in, uh, I should mention, in the initial gravity application that we had, we benefited from this purely cubic interaction representation of Einstein uh, Hilbert gravity by Chong and Remen. It was really, really nice in the build-up, but we can even do the, the recursions no matter how many points are the time that we have. Um, okay, so very briefly, uh, if you want to see this in action, uh, suppose that we have an amplitude or some sort of several that we, have, we want to compute with this sort of propagator structure. The thing that I'm saying is that, for example, if you look at one of the maximum um, diagrams where 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 it has the maximum amount of uh, of propagator, we can we can study the the properties of of this integral on shell. And that gives us um, a denumerator that we want to see. It's, let me call it it, but the numerator that has all of these master uh, functions with, with coefficients. And then the right hand side is just a product of three that I'm calling R here. Uh, we can sample uh, this, this equation over many loop momenta. And in the, in the end, we just have a linear algebra problem where we have um, a, a series of coefficients and a, a, a square. Um, uh, matrix and, and we, we just need to solve for them. We can solve for them and fit the, the numerator out of it. Now you can traverse the maximals and then go down to the next to maximal. And the thing is that uh, uh, the equations are a little bit more intricate, but in essence, it's, it's just basically the same. You have a numerator that you want to fit. Uh, you already have all of the maximals that start to mix up with this one in, in this on shell um, uh, space. Uh, but you also have a, a propagator structure that you can sample and then solve again by uh, for all of the conditions. <laughs> At two loops, for the first time, there is a little bit of an issue that is that you cannot traverse, for example, in this hierarchy, all of the text to maxima because it turns out that this guy in the box has no, no cut, uh, but you can actually solve for it by, by looking at more and more of these um, equations that we call cut equations, and in the end, keep everybody there. And, and that's, that's the way we can actually fit all of these um, um, coefficients. So that's, that's kind of the framework, uh, and it actually works. Let me, this, this is, a, this is a, a plot in which I highlight the computational uh, complexity of the algorithm that we have built up. Here is like the calculation of n gloom color order amplitudes. And in black, we have just three level amplitudes. This is the work by Perez and Hiller from late 80s. Um, the, the, uh, this, uh, the, the line is affixed to a polynomial of the three four. And you see that the, the computation through a parent scaling procedure of three level amplitude has uh, a, a polynomial scale. But you can go to one loop, and this is kind of the, the interesting part. And at one loop, you also see a polynomial uh, dependence um, and, uh, in the calculation of this uh, scattering amplitude. Uh, in this case, it's fit to a degree six polynomial. By the way, it should be eight. Uh, you can ask me what happened. What's Actually, going on there. Quite right, because the premise here, by reorganizing in terms of two degrees, so you can get it down to two. Um, oh, yeah, 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 but, I, I yeah. but here explicitly, you're right. Uh, but here explicitly, I have the four convergence. So then, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. It's, for example, it's the same as it's even more impressive in the case of the work by Sean and Raymond, where you can even make it cubic for, for gravity itself with, with pure Einstein Gilbert. So, yes, that's right. Uh, but but what I want to highlight here is that it's polynomial. Um, um, yes, so this is at yeah, one loop is uh, 60. And at, um, at two loop, we only have two points there. So I don't have to make that. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, but in a sense, the expectation is that, although to tell you the truth, this is only like purely uh, to test the structure of the algorithm, we will never be computing 20 point view. Uh, but uh, but in a sense here we can actually show a little bit that, that we have um, something uh, that is kind of under control. Now, all of this is is, a, is numeric. Uh, in a sense, analytic computation for processes with not too many scales, you would expect them to be considerably more efficient. Um, uh, uh, so. So, so, and, and in the type of amplitudes that we need for phenomenology and collider, we are actually at that level. 
In fact, if you look at the literature, and maybe you can correct me, uh, uh, if you look at which of these amplitudes are in analytic form published in the literature, they only selected six, par six particle one loop amplitudes. Um, essentially, all four particle to loop amplitudes, plus some selected five particle to loop amplitudes, and some selected four particle three loop amplitudes. Um, and if we're going to need much more than that for open memory in the future, it's still uh, to be easier. Okay, so, so that's the technology. Um, now, I cannot talk and say something rather important. Suppose that I look at the results of the technology that I just mentioned with evaluation plotting point arithmetic, as you will, we would normally do um, in, a, in a computer uh, program. Uh, so for the foreground amplitudes, if we are doing one loop calculation, we have only a handful of diagrams, uh, maybe of the order of eight, is this four, four three, three topologies, this is massless or massless. The function spaces, so how big are these spaces that parameterize the integrals, are of the order of 10. And for the QCD analysis, we go up to the order of 50. Um, a two loops things get a bit more complicated, not too much more complicated, but you do have on the order of 100 different diagrams. And the function spaces of, of those for QCD are of the order of 100, and for, for, QE, uh, for gravity calculations go to the thousands. Uh, so these algorithms are rather cycle hungry. You have to do a lot of computations. So you might actually ask, are these calculations precise enough? Uh, we did a study of this uh, early on in 2017. And one thing that we could find is that in the U4 gluon amplitude, at the level of the final uh, amplitude calculation, when you involve master integrals a lot of the calculations, uh, a normal double floating floating calculation would give you of the order of four to five six digits per record. That doesn't sound like very precise. It, there's a lot of things to say there, but but that are not that relevant. So you might say, okay, um, you are a little bit in trouble because uh, so so perhaps for the phenomenology you need to go. Of course, one one easy way to tackle this is to go to higher precision floating point arithmetics, and that we have we have done. We, of course, we have meta language. We can actually instantiate all type of. Uh, all uh, of floating point uh, types, and, and we can do that. Now, but here is where there was a turn, and to me in 2018, this was 2017, this was happening, and it was really, really interesting, and is perhaps the connection that, that I want to end up saying, with, uh, which is the fact that these purely numeric calculations give us a hint or give us a, a, a path to also get access to uh, analytic expression. So, all steps in the procedure that I described can actually be carried out with rational kinematics. So, so suppose that the data, the kinematic data that you have for your calculation, your numeric calculation, is written in terms of rational numbers. So all of the steps that I just uh, mentioned are actually can be put as, as rational operations. So in a sense, we could put the computer to compute with rational numbers, and we get actually back a rational number that is, of course, you know that it would be uh, um, um, exact. Right? There, there would be no, no floating point error uh, mixed up in this sort of arithmetic. But rational computer algebra reflects actually the corresponding analytic complexity of your process. So, so the one, what I want to say is that suppose that you have a function, it could be like this calculation that I just described, and you have some rational simple input, let's say like a half or something like that, and the calculation is rather complicated uh, in the sense that it can have a lot of operations. Um, if, you, if you imagine of an analytic expression, it is a huge expression. Uh, the calculation in the computer will actually be naturally uh, complex. The reason being that the representation of a complicated rational number uh, in the computer uh, uh, ha has no bound size, right? So if you have very large integers, you will have to fit them there, and this becomes rather smooth. Now, we could actually think uh, that if, if all of the operations can be done with rational numbers, we can actually map this into, for example, in a calculation that use finite number fields. So, so what are those? These are just sets of integers. Let's say one through p, uh, sorry, I should have put zero there. 
zero to one uh, to p minus one. Uh, so these are the p numbers that we put in a set, uh, and p is a prime number. And then we think of, of this set and we perform operations on there that are modular p. Um, uh, so for example, if I plus seven or eleven equal one, and you can do product in uh, subtraction, etc. And there is the important inf information that because p is a prime number for every member of F p, you will have a unique um, multipl multiplicative inverse. So in a sense, what happens is that you can produce all the rational operations here, and we say that the F p is a finite number field. Uh, um, so there is a way to map a, a, a rational number into FP by saying if you have a rational number that is R over S, so in the FP that's just R times S inverse. So this is very simple math uh, uh, from high school probably. Um, but it was in 2014 that uh, Montalvin and Schambiker realized they had been, do, been done in, in, in other fields of, of computer science for a long time. But it was Montalvin and Schambiker that realized, oh, but that means that, uh, for example, when I'm doing IPP reductions, I can actually do this fine, use this final field for do the full computations um, um, related to the integration by part identity. So basically, we start by thinking of, of a, a Q to the N input that is mapped into all these finite fields. And then um, if the cardinality of, of, of the finite field, let's say the, the size of these prime numbers is smaller than the CPU size, word size, the computations that are intrinsic to the procedure are actually rather fast. In a kind of uh, approach before, the only difference is that we still have our complicated calculations but our input is mapped into a finite field, and then all of these calculations are rather efficient in the computer. And what is actually important is that we have algorithms, like for example, ones from 81 or, or other that exist, to lift back a finite field result into the, um, into the rationals. Um, and this is actually, uh, I, think, I think this was sort of game changing uh, for us and um, in the field. Uh, in particular, because now that we have this, this calculation with this sort of weird number fields, right? Um, there's, no, there's no connection with, like, if you put a momentum of a particle in these finite fields, it, it, it sort of looks like just gibberish of integers. Um, but the, perhaps more important is the fact that, okay, so, so if I can actually compute all of, all of my coefficients with this, uh, um, Finite fields. And for a second, let me say, let's assume that my coefficients are a function of some parameter, let me call it beta. Uh, so then, uh, assuming that beta has some sort of rational structure, um, uh, and beta can represent, for example, some of the kinematic inputs, or it can be the epsilon in dimension of the realization, it could be ds in the, uh, in the sum of our states. Uh, just by sampling, C gamma over beta values, I can actually determine all of the unknowns of my of my unknown function. I have to put a, an answer, but I actually, I can actually solve. And the key here is that uh, this this calculation being exact, I don't suffer from the precision loss that, for example, I mentioned before in the case of plotting point calculations. So how would you do that? Uh, well, a very quick example. Suppose that you have this rational representation and you write it in terms of the so-called Thiele's interpolation formula. Uh, there is a very simple algorithm that I actually you can build by sampling some random points of your function and solving for all of the coefficients that you have. And just through field operations, we cover the full rational function. By now, this sort of technology has been extended in many directions. Um, so, for example, uh, we can do multivariate rational function reconstruction. Uh, we can do physics aware and such field physics aware and such and solve for the uh, and fit this and such very efficiently. Um, uh, we can. Uh, it has been introduced also the, the idea of using p-adic number for intrinsically even making expansions um, um, in, in certain parameter. Uh, or exploiting part 
partial fraction uh, uh, in the in the procedure of, of functional reconstruction and much more. To the point that I would say that nowadays, even if you end up building a Feynman diagram representation of a complicated amplitude, people are even using the numeric evaluations for the reconstruction of Feynman results and that actually also ends up helping in dealing with the growth of uh, complexity of intermediate steps. Okay, so yes, uh, so we have built a large uh, framework that we call Caravan, um, for in which we have in basically implemented all of the technology that, that I have just mentioned and, and more. Um, it's, a, it's a modular C++ uh, library and that allows to do all type of uh, precision uh, numeric calculations in floating board, rational, modular. You give me a, a number field and we can put it in. <laughs> it's, a, it's as fun as that. Um, um, uh, we also have some algebraic tool for semi-analytic calculations, so, so the, the program can also output analytics and is publicly available. Um, it, it is actually uh, rather large, but I have to highlight the fact that it's very modular. So, for example, we have a, a, a piece of the code that is in charge of computing these products of three. We can easily replace it for, for your preferred um, a technology, of course, we, we have to you have to give it to us and, and we can plug it in relatively easily. Um, and we also have uh, techniques for, for functional reconstruction, etc. Uh, there's a long list of, of objects that we have there. And um, yes, you can go on and actually look at it. And we try to keep it up to date. So perhaps coming back to Ricardo, um, uh, in some of the applications that I'm going to mention next, um, we have made recent extensions and some things are not, we have not pushed it to the public. Uh, but uh, but if needed, we are happy to to actually accelerate this this transfer as well. Okay, with this tool, we have uh, done several applications. We have computed many five particles scattering amplitudes and two loops for standard model physics. Uh, but more interesting to this, we basically have had two applications in uh, for, for gravity. The first one was uh, the the calculation of the two loop. Graviton, graviton, scattering amplitudes. Um, it was it was in 1985 that Gorov and Sanyoti computed for the first time the, the, the first uh, let's say naked UV poles uh, in in this sort of uh, scattering process. Um, but since then, basically, uh, there, there had not been full complete calculation of the amplitudes uh, for all of the helicities configurations. Um, and we actually completed that in the framework, the effective theory framework of autonomy, um, and, and presented it uh, some few years ago. And then, of course, I don't have to say a lot. Um, uh, we also use uh, this sort of technology uh, for the calculation of the third country cost care order terms in the conservative binary dynamics um, for a process in which we have um, a spinning black hole. Uh, included up to S square terms, and you can see uh, Manfred's uh, Manny's uh, talk uh, for all of the details. Um, okay, and so that actually brings me uh, to my outlook. Um, I basically presented the, the numerical unitarity methods um, um, in an incarnation that allows you computations of multi loop scattering amplitudes. Um, the usage of exact kinematics. Uh, and computation actually allow the, the extraction of analytic expression in amplitudes. And I perhaps say there is that, that new standard, perhaps not, and for sure we're going to have analytic calculation. But it's in, for example, in the QCD side that the usage of this idea of exact uh, calculations to uh, reconstruct an analytic expression is, is becoming uh, uh, present in most of the calculations over the last few years. Uh, we have this uh, framework that is Caraval that contains a lot of these tools. Uh, is is available uh, if it's of any need, uh, if, if, if of any help. We're happy to to share and, and give information. And I can say that perhaps the thing that I try to highlight through the talk is that uh, this procedure is actually particularly well suited for uh, calculations in gravity. Um, is perhaps a little bit cycle hungry in computers, but 
but not to the point that that, uh, that we cannot handle the calculation that we hope to perhaps look in the future, like for example, uh, going to higher spins in the sort of analysis that Manny uh, show on Monday, finance at the pace, on lose, etc. So thank you. Plenty of questions. Great job. The last talk of the day. The last talk of the day. Before the comments. 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 No, I'm sorry, I, I put just the denominator, which are difficult yes. for me, and then we split me the math integral. That's it's correct. The, what is actually behind the whole structure of the subtraction that we make uh, to extract these coefficients is that you can do a, sort of a partial subtraction analysis over all of your denominators. So in principle, we can map into any type of theory, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sorry? Dimension or... So, for example, some of the, as I said, we do dimensional um, reconstruction, and that means that we have gone up to like 10 dimensions in some of the calculations we have made. But there's, the code has been structured in such way that this is just a parameter. In principle, you can move it to what you need. So maybe you can have a hands-on session before you leave. I can show some of the tools that we have there, yes. Yeah, I would be happy to show it. So presumably, uh, uh, carbon is one of the legendary effects, you know, uh, in the future for the So as I was showing with these floating point evaluations, of course, the idea is that if you have a floating point evaluation that can be passed somehow eventually <laughs> after combining a lot of amplitudes uh, to a Monte Carlo generator. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, but somehow, since the advent uh, and the observation that at this high level, analytic expressions are unbeatable. By the way, we we might, if you look at the numbers of times that I had there for one of the five point amplitudes, one numeric calculation can take up to uh, a minute, two minutes uh, for a four gluon amplitude, a uh, five gluon amplitude. But once we have extracted the analytic expression, the evaluation of these things are under a second. So, so because of that, we have kind of moved to the to be in focus on extracting analytic information out of the evaluation that we make, and hope that for phenomenology we really just deliver these things and assemble them in, into matrix elements that can go into the uh, eventual directors. Yes. So that's how it's working now. Some people believe that improvements of what we have here might actually be the answer for the future of really going fully numerical. Because, for example, if you go to six uh, on amplitudes that might be needed for some phenomenology, perhaps yes or not, um, maybe even at that level, some efficient numerics will beat. But but I, I don't know. Uh, at the moment, somehow everything is about try targeting analytic information. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. I've just got a quick question. When you talk about the relative complexity between QCD and gravity, the one and twos, is the difference there just the mass dimension? Um, oh, yes, exactly. So it's just the, the, the power counting, yeah, exactly, mass dimension, um, which for the maximals is like double, but you know well that then it's even more than double, I guess. Uh, but what is really beautiful is that the production of the surface terms for the right and right calculation was just straightforward. And the integral parametrization for the full uh, gravity calculation is less than uh, two megabytes. I mean, it's, it's something really compact when you think that the integral written in terms of Feynman diamonds would be terabytes <laughs> for. Well, you don't need to really work right? but but yes, for even the numeric parameterization is actually rather common. Uh, so, what's the, what is the highest speed that you need to play? A P, a P, oh, ah, exactly. Um, so, 
Most of the community use uh, something just below 2 to the 64. Uh, we somehow have opted for using uh, something just below 2 to the 32, uh, just because then we can fit all of the operations. We don't need like like two two integers, two long integers uh, to, to fit. Uh, but but it, it can be uh, yes, it can be fit to whatever your need is. Yes. Some people doing PID calculation now is even thinking of doing calculation with the small prime numbers. So there's some benefit to that. Um, yes, that, that we have not uh, explored, but uh, yes, up until now it was tend to. to you mentioned that if, if, uh, if you can always mimic a larger prime by having multiple primes on the given side, and you do essentially sew the results together. Yeah. The Chinese exactly. That's, that's actually a very important comment. Sometimes, one prime number is not enough, but you can Chinese reminder two calculation with two different prime numbers to actually get the information that you need for getting your analytic results. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So this example, uh, uh, same, uh, yeah, same people. But let's say that that in the lift up to the rational number, you don't have enough information. This can happen. Then you can do your Chinese reminder with using two evaluation in different prime numbers. And sewing them together through Chinese uh, reminder here. So yeah, and uh, presumably you have to stand for speed the set of scalar problems. Like uh, your, uh, I mean, it's with the speed you have a new vector, so you're gonna have to dot problem with all your momenta, extend your space. Yes. So yes, for example, um, Margaret can actually say um, the scalar scalar calculation is really compact uh, in 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 function spaces of parametrization of this integral. But the moment you go to the vectors, it increases considerably. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think the largest uh, system of equations we have installed in the scalar vector space is about like 8,000 unknown coefficients. Okay, okay. But compared to the one without uh, without the speed, like what's the ratio? Yeah, without speed, is, yeah. I think we didn't have to go beyond 1,000 or so. No, but it's literally like the very first time when we don't know, because yeah. a lot of these coefficients are zero. So in the very first situation, we you just remember which one was exactly zero, then you don't compute. Yeah, I we have a warm up procedure yeah. that remove all unneeded functions, and, and normally we see a lot of a huge drop off in this calculation. Ah, what would be like the level of 500? I yeah. see. I see. Yeah, the, yeah the, the scalar, scalar, two loop amplitudes for the calculation of the force and conflict correction. Um, they might take uh, under a minute, uh, but for the for the vector, they can go for um, 30, 20 minutes, something like that. So I say, well, yeah, just imagine that the space was increasing, yeah. and I mean, you have to be considering a lot of. Uh, but as you see, also the the fitting of the answers, of course, is is uh, embarrassingly parallelizable. So then, I mean, we can actually do these calculations in parallel really quickly and, and get it back. Maybe you mentioned already, but the, uh, how many loops can be done after implementing the color? Uh, so, so the, the techniques that we have developed uh, uh, can be applied to to high loops levels, but we have only done up to two, two loops so far. Okay. Uh, but Irene can tell you a little bit about our efforts. We are she is trying to to extend some of these things for three loops, and and we hope to to be able to to go to high loops. Yes. Okay. Should, should look any points or looks five points? To look five points will be will be so we can look at I think we have looked at like six points without integrating. We have that. so so in two loop we can go to to higher points, uh, but full calculations on only five points. Yes. Okay. And presumably with primary theories with lesser with less topologies can keep you going. Correct. Yeah. Yes. But if you just want any Awesome. Well, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.